Hello everyone, in this video we are going to talk about the mechanics of power screws. Power screws transmit power through threads. So the example of that could be the clamp that we are applying clamping force here. So that would be force F if you are clamping. Based on the force that we apply to the handle, it's going to create a torque for us based on the distance and that torque will create the clamping force. Or another example could be a jack or press for lifting load. And in this case, we can lower the load or raise the load. Here we are transmitting power, which means that we are dealing with the torque in addition to velocity. Let's look at how the free body diagram of power screw work. Here we have, I'm showing you all the forces acting on the power screw. If you open one thread all over the body of the power screw, we are going to have these triangles. We have the clamping load, F, or the load that we are raising, depending on if you're talking about a clamp or a, or a jack. We have the force that it takes to raise the load, we call it PR. We have the friction, so the threads have friction and they are resisting the direction of the motion. And then we have the normal force that is normal to the surface, normal to the thread. This is for the case of raising the load. If we are lowering the load, you can think of it as the car jack. You are lowering the car after you have replaced the, the tires. So. Here, for lowering the load, the direction changes, and we call it PL. That's the force that it takes to lower the load. And the force of friction would change direction because the direction of uh, motion has changed. The clamping force would be the same, and the N would be the same. The direction would be the same, but uh, the magnitude would be different. Here we have pi dm. That's the circumference. So that's the circumference of one, one thread if we open up the thread. Here we have lead angle, so that's the angle depending on how sharp or blunt our threads are. Now that we draw the free body diagram for our power screw during uh, lowering or raising the load, we can write our equations of motion. So for raising the load, summation of forces in X and Y will give us these equations. And for lowering the load, you can see the direction of friction changes here we have negative changes to positive here negative changes to positive and also PR here we have negative PL that's the difference between the two scenarios in these equations we have two unknown our unknowns is the normal force that's something that we don't know and also PR and here the same thing normal force and PL the rest of the factors are the properties of the thread. Here, lambda is a lead angle that we should have if we have the thread information. This is the coefficient of friction. This coefficient of friction sometimes is shown by mu. It's the same thing. Here we show it by F. And based on these equations, we can find the two unknowns. We have, we have two equations in each scenario. We can find the two unknown. But the unknown that we are interested in is PR and PL. We are really not interested in finding a value for normal force. So if we eliminate N from the equations and find the force P, we can find the PR and PL. If we divide the numerator and denominator by cosine lambda, we can simplify the equation uh, further. Instead of dealing with lambda, we can deal with L pi uh, dm. That's how, that's the information that we normally have. We have the diameter of the power screw, we have the uh, the pitch of the power screw where we can find the lead and, and the mean diameter. And if we simplify it further, if we multiply it by pi dm, these are the two equations that we use to find the force that it takes to raise the load and the force that it takes to lower the load. If you go through each symbol, F is the clamping force or the load that we are raising or lowering. L is the lead, which is the same as pitch for single start, for double start, is double the pitch and, and so forth. 
F is the coefficient of friction, which is mu. Pi dm, dm is the mean diameter. So we have the major diameter, which is by d. We have the mean diameter. Sometimes it's shown by dp or the pitch diameter. And we have the root diameter. These are the three diameters that we deal with. But here in the equation, we use the mean diameter. And we can change the force into torque by just multiplying it by the radius. So here the PR can be changed to TR and PL can be changed into TL. The only difference is that we multiply by the radius or the mean radius for each scenario. So now we know what torque it takes to create this clamping force. So we have found the relation between the torque and the force here for raising the load and here for lowering the load. And obviously, as you can see, the denominator here is smaller than the denominator here. That means that the force, the torque that it takes to raise the load would be higher than the torque that it takes to lower the load. But this is the, if you have a torque wrench, you can know what torque you're applying and then you could calculate what would be the clamping force. Or if you're raising the load, like an example of a jack, you can see how much load you can raise based on that torque. We have a self-locking condition. So as the name suggests, it would lock itself. So if you just leave the power screw, it will not lower itself. So if you have a power screw, let's say here, and then we are using it to lift the load by applying uh, torque to this power screw. If we remove the torque, if we just let it go, is it gonna lower itself or not? And that condition to, to investigate that condition, we can look at the TL, the torque to lower the load. If this torque is zero or negative, if it is equal or less than zero, that means that we do not need any torque to lower the load and the load is gonna lower itself. And that's the condition we use for finding out whether our application, our scenario is self-locking or not. And if you look at the equation, to determine if it's zero or negative, we just need to look at the numerator. The rest of values are not going to be zero or negative. That's the only condition that we need to look at. So we can simplify the equation to this. Pi FDM should be bigger than lead. And if I divide both sides by pi DM, I get that equation. So even simpler. So that's our self-locking condition. So this one tells me that if, if the friction is high, then I'm not going to have, I'm going to have self-locking condition. The load is not going to lower itself because it has to overcome the friction. Or if lambda is low, so tangent lambda would be a low value. So if my threads are not very sharp and are more blunt, then I'm more likely to have the self-locking condition. But the self-locking condition is just looking at, at this scenario. Efficiency is defined differently in, uh, based on the application. Here we define efficiency as the ratio of the torque that it takes to raise the load without friction over the torque with friction. So without over with. And to find the torque without the friction, we have our equation. We just set the coefficient of friction to zero. Cross out this, and then that's what we have. So that's the torque that it takes to create this clamping load or raise the load based on uh, our screw properties. So if I rearrange this equation, I can make another conclusion. T2 pi over L. And remember, that's lead that it could be the same as pitch depending on whether you have single star or double star. For fine threads. If our thread is fine, that means that the lead is small. And because it's in the denominator, that means that the clamping force is high. So for the same uh, torque, 
we can have higher clamping force if our thread is finer. So that's, that's one of the advantages of having a fine thread. But going back to our efficiency, that's an efficiency condition that we can find. And it would be a less than one, because as always, how that's how we define efficiency is between zero and one. And that's the condition whether how much friction that we have in our system. So most of the equations that you saw were developed for a square threads. So if the threads were a square, if we had square thread. But square threads are difficult to manufacture because of these sharp edges. They're not very durable. So acme threads are used, and this is the geometry of an acme thread. They're easier to manufacture, but they're not as efficient. And um, we are sacrificing efficiency for the sake of manufacturing and durability. The only difference that it makes is that this F is divided by cosine alpha. So in our equations, we have an additional term of second alpha. One over cosine alpha would be second alpha. So what is alpha? That's the thread angle. Actually, two alpha is the thread angle. So for acme threads, two alpha is 29 degrees. And then you can find alpha. That's how, that's the value that we need to put in. So that's the only difference between square and acme threads that we need to incorporate. In practical application, we have to use some color. So this is the color. So that's the color and we have to incorporate the color friction. Because when we are applying the load, let's say we are applying a force P to the handle, the thread rotates and then we have a friction between whatever our object is here and the collar. And we have to incorporate that friction force and then of course the friction torque. So what is the friction? The general equation of friction is mu n. Here mu we call it f and then n is the clamping force that we have. So that would be f over f. f times capital F. And here we are gonna find the torque so we need to multiply by the radius. So here our collar, when it's rotating, it's gonna have a lot of friction force opposing, and these are distributed friction force acting. So to create the torque, we have to multiply it by the radius, but the radius is different, so that's why we use the mean radius. So for finding the torque, we have F, the mean radius or the mean diameter of our collar, dc divided by two, will give us the mean radius. And that's how we find our torque, uh, the contribution of the torque for, for the collar. And then we add it to our equation. So this is for the friction, uh, For this is the torque that is required to overcome the friction torque that needs to be added. F is the clamping force, it's the same nature as this F, and then the friction force, here the friction force could be different, it could be the same depending on the material. This is the friction at the thread, and this is the friction of the collar. Sorry, this FC. And DC is the mean diameter of the collar, or the friction diameter of the collar, depending on the geometry of the collar that we need to incorporate. So now this TR is a, is a larger value. We have this component for TL as well. If you are lowering the load, uh, for the examples of the jack, you have to overcome uh, the friction as well. And the coefficient of friction, mu or f, is shown here for you. You can see these, these values. There are a lot of tables that give you the coefficient of frictions. And then the next table will give you the running versus starting. So you can see the running coefficient of friction is significantly smaller than than the starting one. So that's the difference between mu s and mu k, if you remember the static and kinetic uh, friction. And uh, we can, these are given for certain materials, but as, as mentioned, there are uh, many tables to find the proper coefficient of uh, friction value. Our objective is to lower uh, the coefficient of friction so our efficiency goes high, but there are some scenarios that we don't mind a little bit of friction, and that was the self locky condition. If you remember, we wanted the F to be bigger than tangent lambda. Because if we don't have any friction, then the load is going to lower itself.